In this installment, we are going to look at the force of gravity, in particular, Newton's law of gravitation. Where we are situated in the course is this shape here is our forces, and we are looking at the force, the fourth force, of, uh, which is gravity, 2.4. So Newton's law of gravitation starts out with a very uh, important clause that disagrees or will shock you, uh, disagrees with m most people's common sense of gravity is, and that is that every particle attracts every other particle in the universe. Every particle in the universe attracts every other particle in the universe. So you attract the Earth, the Moon, the Sun, the asteroid belt, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, the Kuiper Belt objects, all the stars in our galaxy, all the neighborhood galaxies that we are close to, and every other galaxy and object in those galaxies in the entire universe. We attract and are attracted to and attracted by every other object in the universe. Not just the Earth. All bodies in the universe attract each other, no matter how distant they are. The force itself is directly proportional to the product of their masses. So in the formula you see down in the center here, we have the force of gravity which is directly proportional, proportionality constant, big G, the product of their masses, two masses, and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between their centers. So inversely proportional, inversely means underneath the divisor sign, to the distance between their centers squared. So the product of the mass is divided by the distance of the centers between their centers squared, multiplied by a proportionality constant. It's interesting that historically, this theory, when Newton came up with it, was known as, and has since become known as, the first great unification. And that's because it took two phenomena, gravity on Earth and the motions of astronomical bodies and connected them. It was not at all obvious um, before the time of Newton, even during the time of Newton, that the force that caused objects to fall to the surface of the earth was at all or in any way related to why objects move the way they do in the sky. And so it was Newton that allowed these two phenomena to be united under one particular force. Now this particular law he arrived at um, through a process called inductive reasoning. And inductive reasoning, basically, using some evidence to take one's experiences, the evidence and the data, and their observations, and synthesize to come up with a general truth. So it's not as if Newton collected some direct data and found this exact experiment because he wasn't able to do that with the experimental data he had at that time. He took the behavior of, of the phenomena he was able to see on Earth and he used that and connected it with other means to come up with and derive this formula Fg equals gm m over r squared. So for example, he considered whether it's over r squared or over just r. He considered that and landed on over r squared and for a very good reason it turns out um, and experimentally later it's borne out. So, very, very important concept. So, the piece we left hanging out here when we introduced the formula was this big G. And this big G is known as the universal gravitational constant. And as you might expect, it's universal, meaning it occurs everywhere. It applies to everywhere in the universe under all situations that are involving gravity. And it is constant. It is constant. And that means constant over time and space. It has been constant over all time that we know of and across all space everywhere in space. So another galaxy halfway across the universe, we know that the acceleration um, or the universal gravitational constant will be the same. Now, there are some theorists who've suggested that perhaps this constant has changed over time as the universe has evolved. That has remained to be proved. <coughs> or shown, but in any case, for our intents and purposes, at any moment in time, that G is the same, and that's what we know. Now, the number itself is a pretty scary-looking number, 6.67565 times 10 to the minus 11th. So it's a very small number, 
very, very small number, Newton meter squared per kilogram squared. Very commonly, this, this G, like the little g we know, could be taken to very different numbers of significant digits. We could consider this to be 6.6757. We could look at it as 6.676. We could look at it as 6.68. We could look at it as 6.7. Or we could look at it at just 7, depending on the level of precision. And as we know, how many significant digits we want to use depends on the other data we have available. And so we would certainly want to use the same number or preferably more significant digits, a greater number of significant digits than the other data. So the formula, the force of gravity, we have specified that. This m, this large m, we will call the mass of the larger object. And little m, we will call, not surprisingly, the mass of the smaller object or body. Now it turns, I put those in quotation marks because it's just as true for bodies of equal mass. It just may be helpful in keeping you straight when you are solving particular types of problems, and as we'll see in an additional formula, we'll see. And so R, we've already stated, is the distance betwixt the centers. It is not the distance between the objects nor is it the radius. It is the distance between the centers. And this, this is perhaps the, one of the biggest confusions that people have with Newton's law of universal gravitation. So let me illustrate that with a picture. Here we have one body and we have another body. Each of them has a radius, r. The distance between their centers is represented by this red line. This is r, the distance between the centers. It is not the radius of anything. It is actually also not the distance between the bodies. It is the distance between their centers. And the reason for that is we turn every body into a point object. In other words, if we considered our sun right now that was this large, or we consider it later when it is a red giant in its later phase, and it would be way larger than this. In both cases, we treat it as if it exists only in that point. Now, on a large scale, that's not problematic. On a smaller scale, it is. But that's what we mean by turning things into a point object. It has no dimensions, no distance. So in that case, if we were to shrink the, this, this body down to a point and this body down to a point, then indeed the distance between the centers would be the distance between the bodies because the bodies are points. So one more comment we would make on this page is this idea of an inverse square. An inverse square, if we start with our formula, fg is g m m over r squared. <clears throat> so what we might say is that for a given situation, that means a the two bodies the, the, and we consider different cases, little m, big M, and g will remain constant. So those three multiplied together will become a new constant, k. So then what we can say for any particular situation, say around the Earth, the mass of the Earth, the mass of a particular body around the Earth, and your universal gravitational constant will be a constant. So then the force of gravity that's, exper that's experienced depends only on the distance between the centers squared. And we know, we probably know that if we have 1 over x, we say that is inverse. 
And so 1 over x squared is inverse squared. And so we refer to something as being an inverse squared relationship. All we're talking about is that if we, if we change this, the other thing behaves in an opposite direction. So if we were to double, if we were to double the distance, say, well, that's 1 over 2 squared. So the force of gravity becomes 1 fourth. If we made the radius 10 times, or the distance between the centers 10 times, it, force of gravity would be 100, 1 one hundredth the size. So we make the radius 10 times larger, or the distance between the centers 10 times larger, the force gets smaller by 100 times. So inverse square. We're going to continue force of gravity in the next video.